Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, on behalf of League of Women Voters of LaPorte County and Purdue University Northwest Department of History, Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, and the Honors College, we welcome you tonight and thank you for coming. My name is Bonnie Shaw. I am the president of the League of Women Voters of LaPorte County a nonpartisan organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. We do this by studying um, and studying policies and also by reaching out to the public with civic education programs such as this one and um, monthly lunch and dinner meetings with community leaders who speak to us. We engage voters through voter registration drives, candidate forums, and our online voters guide vote411.org and the um, candidates answer the questions and you can compare uh, compare all of them to each other then and get information about your polling place and everything. We welcome women and men who want to assure that democracy works for everyone. And we remind you of course that next, th next Tuesday, May 3rd is election day your vote is your voice, so be sure that you make it heard. We wish to acknowledge the work of the chair of the LaPorte County League's Civic Education Program, Barbara Collins, it's here. Um, she, uh, Barbara reached out to Professor Frank Colucci, who is back here, assistant professor, of, associate professor of political science here at PNW, and he asked if she asked if he could find a professor who could speak on the subject of democracy versus autocracy. And he was able to do that. And um, he, by finding Dr. Jonathan Swartz, and I'm going to introduce him in a minute, we're honored that Professor Swartz is speaking to us at this time about a topic that he is so knowledgeable about. And we thank both Frank and Jonathan Sports for being here tonight, as well as Purdue Northwest for co-sponsoring this program. Democracy versus autocracy is an important topic at all times, as we need to understand the history of our country and the foundations on which our laws are built. But it's also important right at this moment as we witness the horrific war in Ukraine, which is in part a battle between democracy and autocracy. Jonathan Swartz is Professor of Political Science at Purdue Northwest, where he also serves as Dean of the Honors College and Undergraduate Studies. His research explores comparative politics and international relations with emphasis on economic and military policy. He's the author of Constructing Neoliberalism, the Transformation of Economic Ideas in Anglo-American Democracies, as well as American Foreign Policy Towards the Colonel's Greece, and that's G-R-E-E-C-E, -E -E, um, Uncertain Allies and the 1967 Coup d'etat. He is also the co-editor of Political and Military Sociology and Annual Review. Professor Swartz earned a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Akron and master's and doctorate degrees from the Ohio State University, and he has taught at Purdue Northwest since 2001. And please join me in welcoming Professor Jonathan Swartz. Well, thank you, Bonnie, and thank you for everyone who came out this afternoon uh, to hear a talk on democracy and autocracy. I think we'll get the PowerPoint up here in a minute. Um, as Bonnie said, my specialization is not in American politics, so I have to apologize in advance if you were hoping to hear something solely on American politics. Um, I'm actually, a, my specialty is in international relations and comparative politics, which is a study of countries outside the United States. So uh, that's going to be kind of my primary uh, focus, you might say, although I can give you an opinion about American politics as a layman uh, on the topic. So what I wanted to do and um, what Barbara asked me to do was to uh, talk about democracy and autocracy or authoritarian regimes in kind of a general sense, uh, spelling out 
what we in political science consider democracy to be and then what its alternatives are. So I thought, well, this fits right in with courses that I've taught on this many times. And so I have to confess, I lifted a lot of this from what I actually teach in the classroom about what uh, democracy is and what all other kinds of political regimes are. So I would start very briefly by pointing out that we can basically identify three main regime types or political regimes, democracies, authoritarian regimes, and totalitarian regimes. And so what I want to do tonight or this afternoon is give you a very brief overview of how we would define these three types of regimes and hopefully give you some examples so that when you look out at the world today, or you think of American politics, or you think of politics of some other country, uh, you can think about how we would classify those. And you think about what the criteria are uh, that we might use to characterize a country as either a democracy or an authoritarian regime, or perhaps even a totalitarian regime. So let's start with democracy. I always start off by pointing out the fundamental point that democracy as we know it in this country and as we know it in the modern world is really based on the ideas of classical liberalism uh, and classical liberalism you know we could spend an entire you know semester talking about what classical liberalism is but if you think of people like Jefferson and Rousseau and Paine and Locke uh, and people like that writing primarily in the 18th century these are the people who kind of form the basis of classical liberalism and I think the best um, the, really the most succinct statement of classical liberalism can be found in the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. And so I always talk about the Declaration of Independence and Jefferson's words in the kind of the preamble to the Declaration of Independence as being a really powerful statement of what classical liberal ideas are. And so let me just, I'm sure these words are very familiar to everyone, but let me just read and just make a couple of comments about them. He says, and again, this is Jefferson who, who wrote the declaration. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. I always find that funny because it wasn't evident to everybody in the world in 1776. But he said, he holds these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Of course, we could have a whole nother discussion about the fact that a slave owner is writing these words. One of the great ironies or contradictions of history, perhaps, that someone who could write such uh, elevated, you know, inspiring words was at the same time enslaving other people that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. In other words, rights that can't be taken away. They aren't rights that belong to you because government gave them to you. They're rights that inhere in you because you're a human being. They've been given to you by your creator. And then he says that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Then he goes on to say, and this is really important from a, from a political science point of view, that to secure those rights, governments are instituted among men. It's interesting, I think that's the passive voice there. The governments are instituted among men. Kind of implying that governments, not implying, saying that governments arise from human action. They don't, they, they aren't somehow handed down from on high. And of course, this, we have to again think of the historical context. If you think back to the context in which he's writing, in which we still have absolute monarchies in many parts of Western Europe in particular, where the idea of the divine right of kings, you know, that the king is there because God has placed him on the throne. Uh, this is a direct challenge to that concept. This says, no, actually people create governments. Uh, they're instituted among men and they derive their just powers from, from God? No, from the consent of the governed. The just powers of government come from the consent of the governed. And so the obvious implication of that then is that whatever power government has is because we all have given it to the government, to the state. And the corollary to that is that if we can give power to the state, we can also take back the power that we give to the state. And that's exactly what Jefferson says. He says that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. Again, this sounds maybe kind of ordinary in 2022, but if you can imagine the world of 1776, this is really radical stuff. This gets people hung, you know, in 18th century to say that it is the right of the people to alter or to even abolish their government and to institute new government, he says. 
laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them, the people, shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. But I think in a nutshell, that's a great statement of classical liberalism, that power derives from the consent of the government, government and that there are basic rights and freedoms that inherit in individuals, again, not because government gave them to them, to them but because they are essentially those of, of human rights. And we could get into a long discussion of this, but I think it's a really important point. From a classical liberal point of view, and, and as I always tell my classes, all of us sitting here in this country are classical liberals, probably at heart, because we've all been kind of imbued with these notions. Uh, we kind of, I think, have an, a basic understanding of this, a kind of internal understanding of this, uh, that rights inherit in people as individuals. Now, governments may or may not respect those rights. The rights are still there. So if the Chinese government isn't respecting people's rights, it doesn't mean that those rights don't exist. In Jefferson's view, those rights still exist, they're just not being respected, which is a totally different thing from saying that government can somehow give you your rights. So I could go on for, for a long time about this, but in the interest of time, I'll move on to really the definitional point. And this, and I kind of have two parts to this definition. The first, which you'll, as the League of Women Voters will be really happy to hear, is based fundamentally on the idea of elections. It's not the only definition of, a, of democracy that you could come up with, but I think it's an important one. Certainly an important aspect of what a democracy is. You can't imagine democracy without this, this point right here. And that's the way we choose our representatives, the way we choose those who's going, who are going to govern us. So we're kind of putting into effect the principles that Jefferson talked about in the Declaration. How do we put those into effect? How do we actually run that on a day-to-day -day basis? And the way we do it is through elections. We pick those who govern us through free and fair elections at regular intervals for all significant political offices. So let's just break down those points there for just a couple of minutes. First of all, elections have to be free and fair. Now here, free, you could think of it in terms of money. You could think that they are free, it's free to go vote. And as we all know, you know, that wasn't always the case. Poll taxes were things that have existed. And I don't know if they still exist in other parts of the world, but they existed here. But free here is larger than just money. Free here means that the elections are conducted freely, that everyone eligible to vote, another interesting question, uh, everyone eligible to vote is able to freely participate in the elections, either as a candidate or as a voter or as a campaigner. So you can put yard signs up in your yard if you want to. You can run for office if you want to. You can vote if you want to or not. Raises another interesting question about compulsory voting, which some countries have. So these elections are free. They're fair. And the whole notion of fair is that they are fairly conducted. There aren't soldiers with guns standing outside the polling place or inside the polling place watching how you voted. Um, this was a, it is and still is in some parts of the world a very common tactic to watch how people vote. The old Soviet Union used to have two boxes. If you wanted to vote for the official Communist Party candidate, you would put your ballot in this box. And if you wanted to vote for the official opposition candidates, you could put your ballot in this box under the watchful gaze of the Communist Party officials who would duly note everyone who put the ballot in the opposition box. And you could expect perhaps a visit from someone later asking you, you know, why you had such a problem with the government. And it certainly would make it impossible for you to get basically anywhere in life um, in a system like that. You'd essentially be put on one of those blacklists of people who could not advance in society because you're not a, a loyal person. You're not loyal to the system. So the elections have to be conducted fairly. It also, of course, means that elections have to be, the, the votes have to be counted fairly. Uh, you know, the, can't do ballot box stuffing and uh, you know somehow ballot boxes from the opposition parts of the country end up at the bottom of rivers and lakes and somehow never make it to the voting, you know, the places where they're being counted, those sorts of things. So free and fair elections at regular intervals. You have to have regular elections. You can't have one of these things where you get elected and decide, and many dictators throughout history have done this, they get themselves elected in fact, we'll see a picture of Ferdinand Marcos of the Philippines was a good example of this. Got himself elected, I think, in 1963, if I'm not mistaken, for the first time. Um, and eventually decided, 
that you know elections are costly elections are a real pain uh, people don't want to be hassled with elections you've all decided that i'm a good president why should we bother with this again um, and so you just don't have any more elections or you rig the constitution so you don't have any more elections or you have elections that are just shams i mean communist regimes of eastern europe are notorious for sham elections you know there would be an election but it would be between the official candidate and some officially approved candidate that, uh, as I said, you're already intimidated out of voting for in the first place. So they weren't real in any meaningful sense. But they have to be at regular intervals. Now, what the interval is, is you know, an interesting question. Different systems use different intervals. In this country, of course, have different intervals. If we even think of our federal elections, you know, our U.S. representatives are elected for two years, our U.S. senators are elected for six years, our presidents are on four-year terms. Um, the presidents of France are now on five-year terms. I think they used to be on seven, I believe, in the, in the early front, in the Fourth Republic. Now they're down to five. Um, you can do different terms. Um, British parliamentary elections have to be held at least once every five years. In Australia, they're on a three-year cycle. That's a really short parliamentary cycle, three years. You're basically running for election almost constantly. Um, but they have to be at regular elections or at regular intervals. And they have to be for all significant political offices. Um, you can't have significant political offices that are exempt from popular election. Um, to be a true democracy or a full democracy. And probably this is a good point to say, and, and I was gonna say it a little later, but maybe this is a good point to say it now. Then when we talk about these definitions, this is what in political science we would call an ideal type definition, meaning it is kind of the purest form that you can imagine. It probably exists nowhere in the real world. And in a minute we can talk about even how America perhaps deviates from this to some degree. I would encourage you to think of democracy, authoritarianism, and totalitarianism as more of a spectrum. And regimes fall into the more or less, um, you know, more or less democratic, more or less authoritarian. Now, clearly there comes a point at which you can say, yeah, that's an authoritarian regime, or that's a democracy, according to this definition. But if we think about even the United States, which we like to think of as a very democratic country, we certainly have free and fair elections at regular intervals. But there's a very significant political office that the Constitution exempts, exempts from regular election, and that is, and think of the federal level, the members of the U.S. Supreme Court. Sure, incredibly important position. Now, there might be good reasons for that, and we might say that that's a, a, a perfectly acceptable deviation. You don't think so. <laughs> You know, and you might or might not think that's an acceptable deviation. Certainly the founders thought that there was good reason for doing that and for giving them life terms. Uh, we could have a discussion of whether that's a good idea or not, um, but it would be a deviation. Now, it's funny because on the one hand, we have that deviation. Then on the other hand, uh, you're probably familiar with the fact that in America, we almost sometimes go to the opposite extreme where we open up for election things in many other countries uh, are not necessarily politically contestable. I mean, do county coroners really have to be elected for your country to be a democracy? Does the county engineer need to be elected for your country to be a democracy? Um, you know, are there really democratic and Republican autopsies for the coroner to carry out? I don't, in other words, what is significant is the key point there. It, it may or may not be significant, but any significant political office has to be open to political contestation. But the Speaker of the House, now that's an interesting point that you bring up because that then raises the question, and I think someone mentioned the Attorney General earlier, if you think of members of the President's cabinet, these are offices that we would say are kind of democratic at, at a second level or one level removed. Because if you're the Speaker of the House, you got that job because first you were elected to the US House. And then secondly, you were put into that position by who? other elected members of the house so there is an element of democracy there if you don't like the speaker of the house so if you don't like nancy pelosi today then vote republican in the next election and if everybody did that she wouldn't be speaker of the house anymore that's the that there is a democratic check on that process or if you don't like who the attorney general is or you don't like who the secretary of defense is or whoever vote for the other party at the next election when the president changes then those offices will change as well there is a certain amount of democratic check on that. So it doesn't mean that every single person, every single, 
in every single position of influence is elected, but that there is a democratic check on, let's say, who put those people in those positions. And so that's where the cabinet members would come into play there. This, however, is not really a sufficient definition, I don't think, of democracy. I think there's one extra element that we have to ha add in there. And that is the democracy has to involve a very delicate balance between majority rule and minority rights. And what I mean by that is this. If we limited our definition of democracy simply to having fair elections, that would then mean that any government could do anything it wanted as long as the people making the laws had been democratically selected. Well, we all know that democratically elected legislatures can do things that are profoundly undemocratic. Uh, I mean, if you think of, uh, if you think of the you know, United States history even, I mean, there would have been times, there were many times, um, in which the majority of people, let's, well, if you think of the American South, the majority of people would have voted uh, in many parts of the South for segregation. Does that make, make it democratic then because the majority of the people want it that way? So there's a delicate balancing act because on the one hand, majority rule is really important. I mean, we don't generally like it when the guy who gets the fewer number of votes wins an election. That seems wrong, right? Or if I were to ask all of us, you know, do we want to have uh, snacks after the talk tonight? You know, from third grade on, we raise our hands, we vote, we count the votes. There's this fundamental aspect of majority rule there. But majorities can sometimes do things that are undemocratic. So that has to be balanced with certain articulated rights for minority groups. And here it could be a racial minority, it could be an ethnic minority, it could be a religious minority, it could be a minority viewpoint. This is, a, this is where politics really gets interesting. And of course, if you think of most aspects of most issues that go through the courts, especially in a constitutional sense, if you think of the big constitutional issues that go through the American courts, they almost always involve this balancing act between majority rule and minority rights. So the majority wants it one way, a certain minority is saying that that violates certain fundamental rights, again, could be any kind of minority that doesn't, we always think of it in terms of racial or ethnic, but it could be, again, a minority viewpoint, it could be a minority uh, religion, it could be a minority class of, of people that fits into a certain class. Um, it's a balancing act between those two. There's no hard and fast rule uh, that says um, it says what the democratic outcome there is. And so uh, this is why, you know, when the Supreme Court hands down decisions, they're going to be handing down probably quite a few decisions here in the next couple of months on some pretty big issues. Uh, if you think of them in this light, if you think of them in, from this perspective, a lot of them do involve this balancing act between what a majority of people might want and what a, minor, what a minority of people would claim is a, a countervailing right. So those are always in tension with one another. And, and I don't think there's any you know, easy answer to that. So that's a, a very basic definition of democracy. Other regimes then, so we have our democracies. The other two main regime types are authoritarian and totalitarian regime types. These are ones that deviate in significant ways from the, dem from the democratic ideal. Now, again, there isn't necessarily a hard and fast line where you make the transition from one to another. There are organizations out there, Freedom House and others, that basically try to assess whether or not countries are free and whether political systems are free. You can get online and look at them. And they have a whole set of criteria that they use involving fundamental rights, involving freedom of speech, involving freedom of religion, pol police coercion, whether or not elections are fairly conducted or not whether there's police or state intimidation during elections. They have a whole series of criteria that they try to rank countries on, how free or unfree are they. Um, and according to those, those rankings, those definitions, the countries of Western Europe, the countries of North America are, are pretty free. Again, it doesn't say that any of them are perfect democracies, but they're pretty free. There's a qualitative difference between, I don't know, Canada and China. I mean, we, we all can just sense that. And you can come up with criteria. But it is a spectrum, and, it's, and at some point, we, a country becomes undemocratic to the point you can then say it's an authoritarian regime. And that's kind of our, our second main type. Now, this is where authoritarian regimes get kind of messy. Uh, 
it's a little easier to say what a democracy is than what an authoritarian regime is because authoritarian regimes take a lot of different forms. And I've just put four cases up there of regimes that were more or less authoritarian at different points. We have, in the case of Saudi Arabia, we have a traditional, a traditional monarchy, one in which basically all power resides in the monarchy and there's no civil society to speak of. It's a hereditary monarchy. This is kind of the old traditional style. I mentioned Marcos earlier, uh, someone who was democratically elected. Chavez in Venezuela would be another example of someone who was democratically elected, but then became less democratic over time. I knew you would, Kim. And then we have somebody like Franco, uh, the dictator of, in Spain from 1936 to 1975, uh, who basically seized power, a military leader who seized power in the, in, during the Spanish Civil War. And ruled as kind of a military dictator for those 30 plus years. So you got a wide variety of different kinds of, of leaders there and on different parts of the spectrum in terms of how democratic or undemocratic they are. The fascists, right? The fascists, right? Yeah, the fascist side there, yep, during the Spanish Civil War. So, I mean, yeah, and that's an interesting point you bring up. I mean, if you wanted to classify these leaders on a left or right wing spectrum, we can see that we've got examples of both there. So in the case of Franco, clearly somebody who was on the right, uh, Marcos was more of a kleptocrat probably than anything else, uh, just, a, you know, just believing the country dry, but on the right, uh, politically, certainly anti-communist. Um, Chavez on the left, of course, and then somebody like uh, Crown Prince um, Mohammed, yeah, uh, son of, yeah, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, you know, hard to classify exactly because he doesn't get his position through political ideology, he gets his position through birth. I guess you could say on the right in the sense that pro-American, you know, anti-communist, um, anti-leftist, but not doesn't really fit on the classic left-right continuum. I wouldn't say. Pardon? He's a realtor. A realtor. A realtor. Yeah, just put two billion into the yeah. American pool. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd like to try out being a, a rich Saudi prince. I, I, I'd like to, well, not the authoritarian part, but the, the oil part, I would. The common characteristic here, and again, this is a spectrum, and I say this especially for Kim, because I know he's disagreeing with some of what I'm going to say here, but it's a, whether there's real check on political power or not. Authoritarian regimes to a greater or lesser degree are not checked by democratic politics and democratic elections, especially, or democratic courts in the way that democracies are. I mean, if you think of a, a democratic country, think of the United States, think of Canada, think of Britain, think of Germany, you know, think of your democratic country. What is the check on the power of leaders? Well, first and foremost, I think we would all agree that the primary check is the next election. You know, what keeps politicians more or less honest? It's the possibility of facing defeat at the next election. And I know there's been, you know, I mean, we've seen a lot of this in recent years, a lot of angst and a lot of question about, you know, where's America heading democratically or, you know, whether we're heading in the right or the wrong direction democratically. And I remember in the last, you know, several years, a lot of people saying America's, you know, heading towards authoritarianism. And, you know, well, the, the president who ran in 2020 lost and the president who won in 2020, his party may be looking at defeat in the fall, fall elections of 2022. So we're seeing a back and a forth. Well, that's what we expect out of democratic politics. We expect to see if people don't like the one person, they elect somebody else. If that kind of transition takes place, that's a good indication, not a perfect indicator, but a good indication that democracy is working the way it should. Or if a political leader does something just flat out you know, unconstitutional, illegal, if the courts then can step in and check that person, then we have a good example there that the courts are functioning the way they should. If on the other hand, the courts are basically puppets of the regime in power, or if the person in power basically stacks the court with all their friends, well, how effectively then are they going to be able to function to guarantee the rights of, of, of citizens when the, government, um, when the government does something it shouldn't do? Also, coercion is always present, even if only implicitly. Um, now, you could, of course, say that coercion is present in democratic societies as well. I mean, that's true. You know, 
get on I-94, go 100 miles an hour and, uh, and see what happens, you know, when the police officer pulls you over. You know, they're going to have a gun on their side. There is coercion involved there. So there is, you know, coercion, obviously, in, in, all, in all the political systems. I mean, that's what anarchism is all about, is the rejection of all political systems because they are based on coercion. But the coercion in authoritarian systems is primarily focused on the political advantage of the regime in power. The coercion, hopefully, that's used, let's say, in this country, and again, we can think of lots of exceptions to this, but in an ideal sense, where there's the rule of law, coercion is used in order to protect the rule of law. And hopefully, and, and of course, we've had a big debate in this country in the last several years about this, hopefully the people that exercise that coercion have some legitimacy because we feel like they're exercising that coercion in a fair, just, and equitable way. And when they don't, then we've seen the results of that. And we've seen the, the, the social problems that that can, can bring up because it fundamentally saps the legitimacy of, of the coercive power. Here, however, the coercive power is primarily a tool of the state to keep itself in power over time. That's fundamentally different. This is again where you know you show up at the ballot box, you figure out who belongs to the opposition party, and you harass them. The, you this you shut down journalists, you throw them all in jail. You know these are the, that's the coercive power that's being used in a very different way. On the screen, uh, sure. That's, that's, I don't have Putin up there, <laughs> perhaps I should. Uh, this is General Franco, who was the dictator in Spain from the 1930s to the 1970s. That's the current crown prince of Saudi Arabia. The king is ailing, and so he's designated a crown prince to rule in his, in his stead. Uh, if you know anything about what the Saudis have done recently, you know that you know, they recently basically cap, kidnapped and chopped up an opposition, you know, a member of the opposition in the Turkish embassy in Istanbul, probably on the crown prince's orders, at least most people seem to think that. Pardon? Well, <laughs> I'll leave that as it is. Hugo Chavez, former president of Venezuela. After the opposition had been thrown in jail and courts, okay. And Ferdinand, okay. Mm. Oh, one quick note, uh, just for, or for Zoom and for future, we do have a microphone that we can use. So if people have, we'll have a, well, two things. One, we'll have a question period, certainly at the end. Right. Second, but if you have a question on. to make sure everyone hears, just let me know and I will bring the microphone over. And Ferdinand Marcos, the dictator of the Philippines uh, from 1965 to 1985 or 84. Remember, his wife, Imelda, was the one with the 10,000 shoe collection, something like that. Again, uh, we might call this person a kleptocrat, kind of a made-up word that implies someone who just is in power largely to steal from the public treasury. And then a politicized role for the military, police, and security forces. That kind of ties in with what I was saying about coercion, is that in authoritarian regimes, the military, the police forces, the security forces, become to a greater or lesser degree tools of, of the state in keeping the current regime in power. Okay. Uh, yeah, of, of the three, now I, I love your presentation, don't get me wrong. Um, of the three, the, the Spanish, the Saudi and the Filipino, all of those regimes were significantly buttressed by American militarism, with, yes. the, ex with the exception of the Venezuela. Yeah, uh, yes. I, I, I would question that with respect to Spanish Franco, uh, Spain and Franco. They were, the United States was supportive of Franco to the extent that he was an anti-communist, but Spain was not a member of NATO during that period. No, um, but there were American bases on Spanish and, soil, uh, B-52 bombers. But you also have to think too about how the, the, the yeah, Franco yeah. regime changed yeah. over time as well. Because, and you know, the United States, off, of course, refused. It did start off essentially as a fascist and, Of course, the United States under Roosevelt, uh, using the excuse of the, of the Catholic vote, Roosevelt did not support mm -hmm. 
the loyalist Spanish During Republic, Spanish which Civil was War. then defeated right. by Franco. We also had a military embargo against uh, the loyalist Republic, which Franco fought. Yeah. No, I mean, you raise a great point, and that is, you know, if we were to come up with historical examples, we can come up with examples on both the right and the left. I mean, um, I mean, I could, you know, start ticking them off. I'll, you know, if you can think of, uh, you know, many regimes in Latin America during the 1970s and 80s were rightist. Uh, more recently, they've kind of switched leftist, but although most of them have become democratic, I mean, I remember when I was in graduate school, you know, the whole discussion of Latin America was, you know, the transitions to democracy there and the failures of democracy there. Well, now almost every country in Latin America is to one degree or another democratic. So it's been a traumatic transformation. And of course, we've definitely seen that with the fall of communism, uh, that with, a, with just a few exceptions, that very well-known exceptions, you know, almost all the ex-Soviet countries are now democratic to one degree or another. So let's then talk briefly about totalitarianism. And I think if I were to ask you, and I will ask you, when I use the word totalitarian, what are the the regime that comes to mind, or maybe the two regimes that come to mind. I wasn't thinking of North Korea. I should have been. But historically, <laughs> what's the classic? Uh, did someone say it? The Soviet Union? And of course, the classic example, often given as the most extreme example of a totalitarian regime, Nazi Germany. I mean, historically, those are the two that you'd probably think of as being the archetypal totalitarian regimes. But You've all pointed out some others. North Korea certainly would fit into that category today. I'd argue that China probably fits in that category today. Totalitarian regimes are special um, because their goal is very different than simply remaining in power. Authoritarian regimes wanna remain in power. Totalitarian regimes wanna take that a step farther and they wanna totally penetrate the state and, then, and society. In other words, what they wanna do is they wanna infuse the society and the state with a governing ideology. They're ideologically driven. So if you go back to Franco, talk about him, I, this sticks in my mind so much because one of uh, my professors in graduate school is a student of Franco's Spain. And he always used to emphasize this, that, that Franco had, in fact, it was said of Franco that he had very little other ambition in life by the end of his regime, except just to stay in power. That was his goal. He just wanted to survive. And in fact, he did survive in power until he didn't survive anymore. And when he died, then the country made a transition to democracy. And Spain is a democracy today. Totalitarian regimes are very different. They're not simply interested in staying in power. They're interested in transforming society. They, they want to penetrate all aspects of society with the state. So if we think of uh, Nazi Germany, or we think of Stalin, the Soviet Union under Stalin, we think, for example, of youth organizations. You know, the, the Boy Scouts were replaced in Nazi Germany by the Hitler Youth or the young pioneers in the Soviet Union. Why did they wanna get rid of the Boy Scouts? Because the Boy Scouts were not political enough. They, didn't, they weren't imbued with the political ideology of the regime. The whole point of the regime is to take over the, 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 uh, the institutions of society, whether they be universities, whether they be sports clubs, the churches, uh, quilting bees, you know, bowling leagues, whatever, and infuse them with the ideology of the regime. And that's that point there, that totalitarian regimes try to mobilize society behind the official ideology. You don't really have the option of staying home and minding your own business. People that stay home and mind their own business are perceived as being people that are anti-regime. So in Nazi Germany, if you didn't go get with the program, then the immediate question is, well, why aren't you with the program? In the Soviet Union, during the height of the totalitarian period, especially in the 1950s, well, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. If you weren't with the program, well, obviously, then you were anti-regime. There was no middle ground. You were either on our side or you weren't. In totalitarian regimes, coercion and control is really heightened to a degree that you don't see in authoritarian regimes. There's an attempt, as I said, to control every aspect of society, to control everyone's behavior, to control your thoughts. And I'm sure you've read articles and, and seen reports on the use, for example, now of modern surveillance techniques in China, you know, with cameras literally uh, now, you know, using facial recognition technology to see what people are up to, to be able to track them around, follow them around, uh, to create lists of people who are safe and who are not safe, meaning safe for the regime or unsafe for the regime. Uh, you know, we've seen examples here in the United States of Chinese students studying here who have said something that the, that the regime in China didn't like, 
um, and fellow students report them back to the security forces there so that their families and them can be put on some kind of blacklist that then they'll never you know, be able to get anywhere in life. This is the kind of heightened coercion and control that, that totalitarian regimes use. And of course it becomes um, you know, particularly frightening in the modern world because the technology is there to actually pull that off. Uh, you know, if you go back to, you know, Stalin's period, you know, Stalin was just relying on informers and he was paranoid himself. So, you know, he was ready to believe that anybody had spoken out against him or, you know, was against him. Um, but now literally, you know, the Chinese communist government is maintaining a database of who's safe and who isn't and literally following people around uh, using facial recognition technology and, and other kinds of things like that. Uh, and giving people basically certificates of, I don't know what they call them, um, but basically certificates of being nationally minded, whether or not you are safe. So if you wanna travel abroad, if you wanna study you know, at Purdue, if you want to uh, get anywhere in life, you gotta have your certificate that proves that you're, that you're, a, you're a stable, loyal government supporting person. And of course the secret police plays an important part in that. When we think of totalitarian regimes, we can almost always think of the secret police that supported those regimes. You think of the Gestapo in Nazi Germany, uh, you know, the KGB in the Soviet Union, the Securitate in Romania, I mean, uh, the Stasi in East Germany. You know, you can think of the names of those secret police that basically whose job was to try to figure out what people were not just doing, but what they were thinking. So it's a whole different level of control. The last thing I'll say about that, so we leave enough time for questions, is that totalitarian regimes are a fairly rare regime type. I don't have a chalkboard here, but if I would, I'd say, you know, we have a lot of democracies over here. We have a big group of authoritarian regimes, but the number of regimes you can really call totalitarian is fairly small. And the reason for that especially up until modern times, is because it was, it's, it was hard to pull off this kind of control of an entire society. You know, it was often said of Mussolini in Italy, he would have liked to have been a totalitarian leader, but the state, the Italian state, simply didn't have the capacity to, to control everybody in the same way that the German state was able to control so much of society. Or if you think of you know, East Germany, there was a good example of a totalitarian regime. Some estimates are that uh, about 99% of economic activity in East Germany uh, during the Cold War period was controlled by the state. There simply was no private enterprise whatsoever. The state was, you know, except for just illegal transactions, there was no private industry, no private transactions of an economic nature. That's real control. John, quick and question? I, wait, let me finish and then, and then I'll go right to the question because I'm basically done with this last point. Totalitarian is a word that's often thrown around a lot. And it drives people like me crazy because it's often used as a term of abuse for people you don't like, you know? So if you're on the right, you don't like people on the left, well, they're totalitarians. If you're on the left, you don't like people on the right, they're totalitarians. Well, you know, this political leader is a totalitarian or this political leader is an aspiring totalitarian. Well, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But I would encourage everybody to think of totalitarian in terms of its true meaning, which again, is a fairly rare regime type that literally aims at the complete control of society by the state. Most things that we tend to call totalitarian are probably in that big kind of messy middle uh, that we would call authoritarian regimes. And with that, actually, it's perfect time for a question because that was the end of my slides there. So perfect timing. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, one quick note, we have a question here. And if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone over for you. Let me turn. And uh, when you have a question, could you give your name first and uh, then give your question for John? Uh, let me turn things over right here. Thank you. Sergeant Anthony Edward Lewis, United States Army Infantry, retired. Thank you for your service. Uh, in the last slide, one of the bullet points you had for defining totalitarianism was the use of the police forces, police the military, forces. security forces. Right. I wanted to know, do you ever see those kind of forces in authoritarian regimes? In authoritarian regimes, yes. You do. Uh, and again, I think it's more a matter of degree than it is of difference. Uh, those exist in authoritarian and totalitarian regimes both, absolutely. Um, it's just a matter of the degree, I think, to which the regime uses those forces, to what extent they're repressive, to what extent domestic politics is controlled by those forces. Yeah, they would be in both, in both cases. And that, by the way, I'll just make this one extra comment. And that 
points out why in democratic countries, people are so concerned about the, improperly so, about the inappropriate use, let's say of the military. You know, so when we think of here in the United States, you know, and we think of the rules governing the use of military force in a domestic environment, it is fairly restrictive. So we concern, we're concerned about that. And then we're also concerned about the possibility of, of course, of our military leaders becoming too close to politics and too close to political leaders. So uh, a friend of mine kind of works on this topic and looks at kind of uh, this phenomenon we've seen both on the Democratic and Republican side where former generals and admirals who then go into politics and make a name for themselves in politics. And she talks about and tries to analyze whether or not that's good for democracy or not. And she expresses concern for that. Uh, you know, the ideal is that uh, the military leaders take their orders from civilian commanders and that there's a, a nice, bright, clear line between the two. Uh, but to the extent that the military leaders think of themselves as possible candidates later and then they retire and they, uh, you know, then they take positions on the boards of the big defense industries and then they go into politics themselves, you know, kind of blurs that line uh, that should leave us concerned. And, but it's ultimately that, that blurring of the lines that we're concerned about, because that's what we see in the authoritarian or totalitarian regime. Yeah. Uh, you had said that you were interested in, uh, oh, my name, I'm sorry, Warren Lemming, PFC, 123rd Signal Division, Würzburg, Germany, Excellent. 1962 to 1964. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you had said that... Um, uh, the, these regimes, which, which we were totalitarian, democratic, etc. Uh, if we step back from the whole question for a minute, right, and look at the problems that that the state faces, mm -hmm. that the techniques that you outlined in authoritarian, totalitarian, mm -hmm. and democratic societies are very similar in the sense that the military comes into play, uh, the secret service comes into play. Uh, facial recognition, which we mm -hmm. do use in this country, comes into play. Are, are these not all uh, similar in the sense that the state, a modern state, I mean, is looking at a whole series of new questions? And I, I refer to our own country, where the question over 2024, in terms of mm -hmm. European analysis, mm -hmm. of which you're well aware, mm -hmm. Uh, Boris Johnson has said that uh, Trump is a criminal and uh, and a fascist, uh, as was said of the Labour leader, uh, uh, said the same thing in the UK. I'd like your comments on on, those. on the technology issue, on the technologies, on the, yeah. and on on the other question of the of the European criticism of our system now. Well, I think on the technology point, you raise an excellent you raise an excellent point, and and I'm sure that all of us, when we see those cameras get a little nervous. Uh, and it's interesting you brought up the European case because when you go to Europe, you go to Britain, for instance, there's cameras on every street corner in Britain. So there's a democratic society that has made a decision as a matter of public policy that they're going to have cameras virtually on every street corner. Now, it's great when it comes to solving crimes. If you read the British papers, you know, they can solve crimes pretty quickly because in about 10 minutes, they usually have, you know, the, the CCTV feed of whoever the criminal was walking down the street before they committed their crime. Probably a lot of us in this country look at that and feel a little nervous about that. And you see those cameras, you feel a little nervous. I mean, if there were cameras all over here and we knew that they were being fed back to the police station, I think we'd all feel a little nervous. Well, that goes back to the founding principles of the country. That goes back to people like Jefferson. There was a concern, a classical liberal concern for the potential for governments to abuse their power. And it's that classical tension between, on the one hand, we all know that the state needs certain powers. I mean, this is, the, this is the whole notion of a social contract, that we have given the state certain powers because we want the law and order and that comes with the, the state having power. So for example, we want speed limits and we want police to enforce the speed limits because I don't want to get on you know, the expressway and have somebody driving 130 miles an hour, as we've maybe all experienced once in a while, somebody doing to us. We say, hey, that's not right. That's illegal. That should be stopped. So we want the state to enforce the laws. We want to feel safe and secure in our society. But especially in a classically liberal society like the United States, there's always this underlying feeling, well, we want to give the state enough power to create a safe and secure society for ourselves, but not so much power and not so much ability to control us that it then becomes, it can, it's so easily abused. And of course, if they were worrying about this in the 18th century, 
you know, can only imagine what somebody like Jefferson or Locke would have thought about you know, the 21st century and the, and the potential coercive powers of the state now. So you're absolutely right. To go back to the European context, um, you know, I, I think what you see there is you see a wide variety of different approaches to how you, you do a democracy, how you run a democracy. As I said, we would be much more skeptical of the cameras than they are in Britain. Uh, in other societies, they're much more used to state control than we are here. You know, we are, the Anglo-American countries tend to be much more skeptical of state control than let's say a Germany or a France. Ironically enough, given Germany's history, uh, the state takes a much greater role, for example, in economic development in many of those countries. Different ways of doing it, but they're all democratic at the fundamental level that we talked about here, which is that ultimately people control who governs them. If you want to boil democracy down to its ultimate uh, essence, I think that might be it is that people control who governs them and throw out people they don't like. Right. Uh, Mary Beth Connolly, History, Purdue Northwest. This is a smudgy kind of question. So coming off of the question about authoritarianism and the, the idea of not having a military leader taking in, in office, the there's a, what about a religious official? So the Catholic Church that tells priests don't become, don't get elected to whatever. Um, they have to step down if they do, if they do so. Um, but in a country like ours where people of faith can hold office, they may, and they are strongly care about that faith and they want more people to have that faith. Where do you see religion bleeding into authoritarianism? Well, that's a good question. I guess I would say that, if, first of all, in a democracy, we know the backgrounds of the people that are running for office. So we, unless somebody pulls a fast one on us, we know what a person's views, I mean, if you think of the president, I mean, if you don't know what the president's views are before he or she becomes president, you don't know what their background is, you don't know what their religious affiliation is, you haven't been paying attention because we know what they are. We know what their faith is. We know how firmly or, or, or not they are rooted in their faith. And hopefully we know to what extent they want to uh, bring their faith to play in office. Um, and so then we elect them. But then I guess I would say we have our constitution, we have laws to be kind of the guardrails on, hopefully, on what would be an, an inappropriate use or in, of that influence. And then if we don't like what they've done, again, going back to the fundamental point, we can throw them out the next election. Um, I would say that, and this would just be my own personal opinion here. I mean, we've never really had a theocratic leader like that, at least in modern times. It's tried to take an overtly theocratic approach to everything. People have brought their faith into play, of course. But um, I think the problem would be when you then started to use the, the, the agencies of the state then to try to impose that on others. Then we start getting into the problem. Uh, you know, if we have a, a, a candidate that's pro-choice or pro-life or pro pro-school prayer or anti-school prayer. I mean, we know that going in, you vote for that person or not against that person based on those views. But if you're then starting to use the organs of the state to try to coerce, you know, religious practice or coerce religious, um, you know, let's say worship, for instance, then hopefully both your constitution steps in, your courts step in, and the next election steps in to remove such a person. Um, this is a good question. Um, of course, we're also in a country that has traditionally thought of the separation of church and state as being much stronger than in many other countries. I mean, we don't have a state church. I mean, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, is the head of the Church of England. I mean, they've been able to work that out in a way that I think most people who are not members of the Church of England, who are not even Christian, don't really see that as fundamentally discriminatory against them. She has played it properly and constitutionally. Uh, or, you know, in, in the case of Germany, you know, that both the Catholic and the Lutheran churches are, are supported by, by, tax, by tax money. Uh, some people don't like that, but, you know, I, I, I think it's a, it's a public policy choice that countries have made and, and ultimately the people make on what the limits of religious, uh, what those boundaries are. I mean, obviously here in a country like you know, this, you know, the whole idea of the state supporting one particular church would just be unthinkable, whereas in many European countries, it's accepted as being fine and, and democratic. Yes. Well, I was, hi, Bob Swan, hi. Uh, Rolling Prairie. Um, uh, there's a thing called the prayer breakfast that they have in Washington. And those people, those people are, are, are pretty much uh, on the right. They're both pretty much on the right and they, they support all that, all that sort of stuff. There was a, there was a, uh, I think a whole TV series about 
the indoctrination, the, the, the inculcation of somebody into that group to make sure that the, they were all righteous, you know. And it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty, that was a pretty frightening series. And I think the prayer breakfasts are pretty frightening too, frankly. Well, again, going back to the democratic, the idea of democracy in elections, then if the majority of people in the country think that the prayer breakfast is wrong, then they ought to elect a candidate who won't ever go to a prayer breakfast. And that would be the democratic response to that. Now, um, if people are okay with it, and I would, I, I don't, you might very well be right, but it seems like presidents, and I don't know this for sure, but it seems like presidents of both parties have been going to these for a, for a long time. They kind of got to go because that's a constituency that that's becoming, you know, or has been very important. Uh, right. But you know, it's it, you know, but it is very interesting to see as as religion wanes in American society. Because on the one hand, I think there's a sense that the religious right in particular has become stronger. But yet, on the other hand, when you look at lots of public opinion polls, what we see is that actually the influence of traditional Christianity is in, for the rest of the population actually declining. Church membership, I think, is at an all-time low. Church attendance on an average Sunday is at an all-time low. I mean, if you think of, of traditional issues, or if you think of issues that, you know, traditional Christianity was against, you think of something like gay marriage, for instance. And this is something that the young generation, you know, doesn't take a traditional view on at all, and in fact, doesn't see a, an issue at all. So I, I think you might be right that there's a strong, there certainly is a strong kind of right-wing uh, Christian constituency in this country. But I would argue overall, I think that, and again, I'm not an American ex politics expert, but I think the public opinion polls have actually shown a decline uh, in religiosity among, amongst pretty much everybody else. I mean, um, I, I don't think religion is quite the marker for everybody else that maybe it used to be. Um, I mean, President Obama, I think, was the first president we've had since I think Abraham Lincoln not to have been affiliated with any one. He was really a member with the United States Christ of Chicago, but then he disaffiliated after the political controversy. I don't think he, I think he was unaffiliated. And that was the first president we've had who's been unaffiliated. And of course, in, ironically, from, from your perspective, we now have a president who's very open about his religiosity and he happens to be a Democrat, which is not normally the way you think of it. But uh, President Biden has been very open about his Catholicism. Kim Sipes, I'm a professor here at BNW Sociology. One of the things you haven't mentioned, Jonathan, is anything about the media. And the reason I bring the media up, and this goes back to the point about Venezuela, mm -hmm. um, is that according to the media, Hugo Chavez was a dictator and all this other stuff. On the other hand, I have been, I was both in the Philippines under Marcos and under Chavez, and Chavez was not a dictator. They had free press. They had private control of the press, unlike all those other three that you mm -hmm. showed. Mm -hmm. What's the role of the media in all this? I'll be honest and say that I take a more institutionalist view of politics. And what I mean by that is, for me, democracy is primarily the functioning of institutions, the, the state institutions and the, and the organs of the state, like elections, like security forces, like police. Um, the media is incredibly important from a social point of view. Um, but the media in the way I see democracy only comes into play insofar as it's not controlled by the state. It's not coerced by the state. If you've got a free media that's able to say what it wants, rightly or wrongly, correctly or incorrectly, to me, that's an, that's an agency or that's a group of civil society that should in a democracy have the freedom basically um, to say whatever it wants, rightly or wrongly, and it's up to people to decide whether or not they like it. So um, I know there's a lot of concern about the media in terms of whether it's a democratic force, a pro dem, you know, or an anti-democratic force, uh, whether or not it controls people's, you know, views of things. And certainly it is extremely influential, but I just don't see how in a democratic society you can quote, do anything about that because ultimately a free press is, I mean, going back to our own constitution is one of the bedrocks of our own constitution. Well, it also belongs to those that can afford free press like Elon Musk just, uh, just showed. All right. But I but, think but I would just to just to question you on that, Kim. So what's the alternative to have a state press? I mean, the state well, press will then just be, as we've seen just through experience, then becomes an, an organ of the of the state's own interests. Well, yes and no. BBC would be a questionable one on that, maybe. But the, the larger thing is that in your example of your authoritarianism, and I think that's a poor term that you political scientists keep dragging out. 
Uh, it just depends on whose side of the, uh, your bread is buttered. But if you look at the four that you gave, Franco from Saudi Arabia and Marcos, they control the press. The press was not controlled under Hugo Chavez. And one of the things that the US government has done and, and our press has continually lied about that and continually lied about Venezuela, which has freer elections than the United States well, does. It, well, I would just say it couldn't just be the United States, the United States media, because the European Union feels the same way. All the countries of Europe basically have taken the same NGOs like Freedom House that I mentioned have taken the same view. Come on, Jonathan, you know, not Freedom House. You know, that's Human Rights Watch. I mean, look at these organizations that have rated, you know, the level of freedom in a country like Venezuela, say, comp compared to a country like Canada. I mean, either they're, you know, so where is their interpretation coming from? Are they just tools of, you know, the West and the Western viewpoint or? Well, are, that's, that, that certainly is a possibility. I mean, look that's at, usually the media that's, around, that, around that's uh, what's the, happening that's today. That's usually the explanation for why countries like that or like Cuba, let's say, get ranked so poorly is, that, well, that's just Western imperialism. But I think if, if, if you don't adopt some kind of, and this is what I said at the beginning, and I don't know if you were here quite yet, but these organizations try to come up with a set of rubrics, they kind of come up with a set of criteria that they, they do apply to everybody. And if you apply that fairly to everybody, and that's, I know that you're questioning that, but if you apply it fairly to everybody, then everybody, then every country should be willing to, you know, to take its lumps and you can, and they certainly, the organizations I've mentioned certainly critique the United States in various ways as well. Uh, certainly when it comes to racial justice, heavily criticized by organizations like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International on the death penalty, for instance. And also in, in the U.S. trying to uh, extra, get Julian Assange extradited from, from Britain, a case of where somebody who revealed war crimes is being brought to the U.S. so he can be in prison forever for eliminating those war crimes because they were conducted by the U.S. military, of which I'm also a veteran. Right. I, you hadn't mentioned that, but I was wondering. Oh, I could take another question or two, sir. Okay. As long um, as people have energy. We have a couple of questions. Anyone who hasn't asked a question yet, uh, we'll give a preface then. Here's one. Thank you. Janusz Dzikiewicz, PNW History. A distinction has been made between a parliamentary democracy and a presidential democracy, with Britain as an example of a parliamentary democracy, the United States and France as an example of a presidential democracy. And someone has, uh, um, someone has theorized that a presidential democracy is more, has more of a danger inclination to become authoritarian uh, as opposed to a parliamentary democracy. And that has implications for the U.S. if that's true. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, that was that was and has been a, kind of one of those debates uh, that has been kicked around in political science for a long time. Uh, again, I remember when I was in graduate school, there was a kind of a well-known book, well-known in political science terms, which means there was about you know twenty people that read it. Um, but there was a there was a technical book, kind of a specialist book. Uh, written by a specialist on Latin America and on Spain uh, called The Perils of Presidential Democracy, basically arguing exactly what you're saying, Anna, it's that presidentialism is a system that, that has built within it the possibility of authoritarianism. And, and his argument was, and he was writing primarily about Latin America as they were starting to make the transition to democracy, that his view was that they would tend to, his view, hope was that they would tend to adopt the parliamentary system. Most of them did not, of course, in the end. They interestingly kind of followed our model more than the European model. Um, I guess that's always a possibility, but I think we can see the parliamentary systems are, are just, I don't as susceptible, but they are susceptible as well. I mean, if we think of, uh, I mean, if you think of Nazi Germany, you know, there was a, uh, you know, there was a system that was a, a parliamentary system in which the chancellor was chosen based on the majority of seats in the, in, in the Reichstag. That you know didn't save them at all. It didn't save a lot of other countries. I guess in a the theoretical way, it's possible. But I think if the rule of law is strong enough, and I think that's ultimately the key, the rule of law is strong enough. If the commitment to democracy, and this is where we get, and this kind of ties into what Kim was arguing earlier. You know, this has all been kind of institutional and the way the system works. But at its heart, democracy only. Well, you can have any system you want. You can have any constitution you want. But unless the people themselves are committed to peaceful democratic politics, the peaceful exchange of power, uh, 
unless they're committed to the rights and freedoms of everyone else as, long, as well as themselves, if they're committed to the idea that political leaders have to be subject to the will of the people, that's what makes democracy work. When that starts breaking down, that's when you get into trouble. Um, so I, it's a good question, um, but I think it can work either way. I think, I think in that case, political culture is probably more important. First of all, professor, yeah. professor thank, you. thank you. I want an A from the class. <laughs> um, it was brought up how, or the question was, one of the questions that was just asked related to how does religion factor into these different regimes? I don't think it was on anybody's radar to see how the Orthodox Church in Ukraine was going to split right down the middle severely and suddenly so much as our politics here in the US has split almost 50-50 straight down the middle. I think the question in the minds of most people right now, as you look at the different kinds of regimes that there are, democratic, authoritarian, totalitarianism. I think it was just a, a month or two ago, was it the CIA or the State Department that said that the United States is now a democracy in decline how much further does it need to decline before we actually slip into authoritarianism? If a third of this country does not believe that the last election was free, fair, and transparent, what's the percentage that it needs to get up to until this country, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, vanishes from the face of the earth? I'll have to just say that from, I have to disappoint you in my personal view. Uh, I don't think American democracy is under threat the way a lot of people think it is. I think it's a lot more resilient than people give it credit for. Uh, I think there was a tendency in the last five, six years uh, to think that, you know, the end of American democracy might be around the corner, that we had a president that a lot of people thought undemocratic or anti-democratic or had totalitarian tendencies or cozied up to dictators, you know, whatever. Perhaps that's all true. But I think we learned that, and I think we should always remember that the system is so much bigger than any one individual. And that all the, I use the term guardrails for lack of a better term, uh, are still in place. And that you're right, a good chunk of the American population doesn't think that the result of the 2020 election was fair or free. Um, but then if you go back in American history, you can find other examples of other elections. I mean, if you look at the post-Civil War elections, you know, there were a number there. I mean, you had an entire portion of the country that, that didn't think that the events of those decades were, were fair or free. Uh, the system's a lot more resilient than that, I think. And, 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 and I keep going back to the fundamental point that in 2020, um, the American people voted one guy out and brought another guy in. Uh, and that's ultimately what the system is intended to do. If one person wins the election, the other person loses, and one person gets kicked out and the other person gets in. And we may see a swing or not a swing this fall, but as these, this is what we would expect from a democracy. Um, the fact even that we're worried about these things, going back to my point of political culture, is an indication of the strength of American political culture and strength of democratic sentiment here. We weren't worried about these things. We, we didn't think about these things. We didn't argue about these things. Then you have, you, you have trouble. But the fact that we worry about it, we think about it, uh, American democracy is, in, is incredibly strong. It's not perfect. I mean, I, you know, all we have to do is watch the news of the last few years. And you think of the George Floyd situation. We think of all the other situations we've seen in recent years. I mean, we've shown yet again that America is not a perfect society and, and we're not a perfect people and we don't have a perfect system. Uh, but it is an incredibly resilient system. And if you think back, if you, if you think, put it in historical context, if you think, for example, of the Civil War period and, and the fact that the country survived that, or if you think of, you know, the challenge of reconstruction and, and, and the country survived that very imperfectly and it took the civil rights movement to bring that around, and I don't want to be Pollyannish about it. I mean, nothing is guaranteed. Um, but certainly we're a much more democratic, much more egalitarian, much more equal society today than we were 20 years ago, and certainly more than 50 or 100 years ago. It's an incomplete journey, for sure. Uh, 
but it's an incredibly strong political system. And, and, and I mentioned Latin America. I mean, the fact that other countries have you know, looked to this model and say, hey, you know, let's, let's, let's see if those institutions will work for us, I think is, is a recognition of that. Um, so I would be more optimistic, I think, for the long-term future. And, and you know, the, the, the political vicissitudes kind of come and go, but I think the long-term tra tra trajectory of the United States, if you think about it, is definitely in a more democratic, more egalitarian, more equal direction. And, and I think that the last few years have shown that even more than ever before. I mean, we're talking about things and discussing things that even five or six years ago we wouldn't have talked about. Should we make this the last one then, uh, Bonnie? Don Briggs here, Michigan City. Okay. Uh, we're focusing on uh, political organizations, mm -hmm. secular organizations, and categorizes, categorizing them as uh, democratic, authoritarian, or totalitarian. In the same way, we can characterize various religions, various factions, various denominations, various religious um, institutions as primarily aligning with or having affinity with each of those three categories. Okay. That has become a big problem. Can I, oh, Frank, yes. Mike, wait. I was just going to ask, so how would you think that plays out in the current context? Are you thinking primarily religion being associated with the right in this country or? Well, going back to um, the original split between the, in a particular instance, the, the, the Baptists in the United States back in the 1830s, we had American Baptists. Then, in the aftermath of the, well, as part of the result of the Second Great Awakening, there was a national um, focus. It was uh, faith based, but ecumenical. Mm -hmm. Focus on abolition or civil rights. Right. Uh, the women's movement, there's a right to vote. Okay, and we still we can still have that, and then temperance, which is substance abuse. These are all still with us, but it was in the aftermath of, as a result of this second great awakening, that we had this abolitionism. The northern, the, the, the General Baptist Convention, um, then decided that they weren't going to to uh, subsidize missionaries to. Africa from slave owning states. That was an affront that the Southern Baptists could not tolerate. We had a split then, and it's been with us ever since. And it's still along those lines civil rights, women's rights. I, I would just say, in terms of religion, and this is just my own personal viewpoint, this isn't political science point, I guess, it's just my own personal view is that I think if you look at the 20th century, the greatest threat to democracy did not come from religion. It came from militant atheism. I mean, more people were killed in the 20th century by communism than by any other political ideology. And that was in the name of political, oh, if you look at probably 100 million people died under various communist regimes in the course of the 20th century. And that was all in the name of militant atheism. I mean, the, the example that we gave of a totalitarian, and even the example we gave of a totalitarian regime in Nazi Germany, was not religious in any identifiable traditional way. In fact, it was either anti-religious or some weird pastiche of pagan ritual and Christian ideas, Teutonic norms, whatever. Um, militant atheism has been a much bigger threat to, to democracy. I mean, all you have to do is look at you know, Eastern Europe from 1945 to 1990 um, than religion ever has been. We have our theocratic regimes around the world. I mean, there's a few, Iran would be one uh, for sure. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't necessarily see religion as being the fundamental threat. Again, religion within the proper boundaries of a society that supports democratic ideas seems to work well. It's when, it's when any ideology goes beyond those boundaries of democratic ideas that you start having problems. Wow. Well, thank you. I'll leave it at thank you. <laughs> Thank you for, um, for this education and also for giving us hope. <laughs> That's right. Answers you gave. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks Thank everybody. you.
and thank you all for coming. I believe there are still refreshments left, so grab something as you go out. But thank you all for coming tonight. Yes, and there is a sign-up sheet out on the table if you want to um, get more information about League of Women Voters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I need to put everything.